Turn with me to 1 Kings if you would. 1 Kings. And uh, we're going to be picking up there in chapters 9, 10, and 11. Man, we have seen David pass off the scene. We saw his son become king. We've seen that his son has it in his heart to worship God, and he's built the temple, and, and, and uh, he, the, the heart of people are just stirred up. He finishes his, his house. We'll see this in just a second. In chapter 9, starting in verse 1. Go ahead and find that text. And then, and then at the end of that kind of season, God comes to him a second time and says, Solomon, if you will guard your heart, that's what I want you to remember tonight. That's what I want you to remember this weekend. If, if you will just guard your heart, then I'm going to bless you in amazing ways. But if you don't guard your heart, the lesson is you're going to lose the blessings I intend for you. We're going to see this. If then, if you obey, then here's the blessing. If you disobey, here's the consequences. And it will all boil down to one thing. Whether or not Solomon will guard his heart. And friends, can I just give you a, just flat out, one of the biggest, if you've trusted Jesus as your Savior, you're walking with God, the temptations of life will always move us away from simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ towards sin and what we're going to see in Solomon's life, he says, yes, I'm going to follow God. I'm going to follow God. He preaches that to others. But success, in other words, God's blessing, and time, Satan takes advantage of that. He's going to do it with Solomon. He's going to do it with you and me. And that's why we've got to be diligent, diligent and vigilant to watch over our heart, to watch over our heart. How many of you ever watched a child before? You ever watched a child? Okay, so think about this. You got this little, this little child there. And, um, and, and the child's doing this and doing that. And you walk outside, and the child wants to always run. I don't know why kids do this. Have you ever noticed how they always run to danger? Like, there's a street. They're, like, running right into the middle of the street. And so you got to watch over them, and you got to rein them back. Hey, no, you, you, that's what it means to guard them, to protect them, protect them from danger. So in, in Proverbs, how that verse is used about guard your heart with all diligence or watch over your heart with all diligence. Your heart is prone to wander and you've got to pull it back. We'll talk about several ways in which we do that in just a moment. But, but Solomon, you've got to do this. And friends, the lesson for us is we have got to watch our heart. I can't do it for you. You can't do it for me. There's some personal responsibility in this. Watch over your heart. Look at these verses. Notice the if-then statements. And we'll start in chapter, chapter uh, 9 and starting in verse 1. It says, Now it came about when Solomon had finished building the house of the Lord. That's the temple. Remember, seven years to build that. And the king's house. That took another seven years. Fourteen years has transpired. And all that Solomon desired to do, that the Lord appeared to Solomon a second time. As he did when he appeared to him at Gibeon. And you remember Pastor Nate shared with us on that text. In chapter 3, he's worshiping God. That's where you and I need to be, worshiping God. And that's when God shows up in his life and asks him the question. Ask, and I'll give you something. Because God is a giving God. You remember that? And so, so he says, give me wisdom that I may lead your people in justice. I'm young. I don't know how to do that. What a great question. He sees himself as a servant of God with a responsibility and duty to care for the people of God. So he asks for the right thing. And God says, not only am I going to give you wisdom, I'm going to give you riches, and I'm going to give you peace and prosperity and so forth, because you asked for something so excellent. I mean, you're not like anybody. This is a reflection of his heart. Now, 14 years have passed, and it says there in verse 3, Then the Lord said to him, I have heard your prayer and your supplication, which you have made before me. Remember, this is the dedication of the temple. We looked at that in chapter 8. And I have consecrated this house, the temple, which you have built by putting my name there forever. Notice, my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. You know, that, that temple mount area I shared with you is such a sacred place to God. God has chosen that place for his name to be known. Think about all through the, the, the books of the Bible that we've studied so far, starting back in Genesis chapter 12, that's the first time Mount Moriah, that, that, that place where the temple is, 
is the first time it's mentioned in the Bible. It's going to be mentioned over and over and over, and not only here, but also all the way into the millennial kingdom. And God's heart is there. Verse 4, it says, And as for you, if you will walk, so this is the first if, circle that, and you're going to get the then here in just a second. If you will walk before me as your father David walked, in integrity of heart and upright, doing according to all that I have commanded you, and will keep my statutes and my ordinances then. So here's the if. If you will walk with me. If you'll keep my commandments, then. Then I will establish the throne of your kingdom over Israel forever, just as I promised to your father David. But if, second if, but if you or your sons indeed turn away from follow me and do not keep my commandments and my statutes, which I have set before you, and go and serve other gods and worship them, then, so there's the if then, then I will cut off Israel from the land which I have given them and the house which I have consecrated for my name I will cast out of my sight. Father, I pray that these if-then statements will resonate in our heart because it was totally conditioned. These are conditional promises that you gave to Solomon. You give us some conditional promises. Those if-then, if you will obey me, here's the benefit. If you disobey me, here's the consequences. Father, as followers of Jesus who have received the free gift of eternal life, Hear, help us to hear these words so that we guard our hearts, watch over our hearts with all diligence. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, there are so many things. I, I trust you're picking up on them. For example, we're, we're learning about how God, the God of heaven and earth, relates to his people Israel, ethnic Israel, the promises that he has for them, the promises that God has for us through them. We're also learning about how God deals with nations. Now, this is really important. We understand that there are, are, are propositional truths. In other words, God makes truth statements. And God also gives us wisdom statements, principle statements. Now, this is really important because America has lost the ability to discern and to think in the area of wisdom. Just recently, I was at a, at a meeting, and I was talking with my friends, and, and I, kept con I kept putting conditions. You know, I was like, well, you know, this is the way it is, but I got to understand it's not 100% that way. And finally, my friend just interrupted me and said, stop saying that. I understand how wisdom works. How many of you know that wisdom are general statements, like the book of Proverbs? They're statements that are generally true, 90%, 95% accurate from a historical perspective. They're not guarantees, but they're, they're, they're principles of wisdom. So important. So we're learning principles of wisdom as well as these these propositional truth statements. Now, what's a proposition? A propositional truth statement is something like this. Two plus two is always four. So if I give five, then a true statement would be, that's the wrong answer, right? You understand what I'm saying? Now, we live in a day and age that once we lost wisdom, we can't function in that realm, and now we've lost propositional truth. Like, there is a God of he in heaven. There is a God who speaks, i.e. through the Bible. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Those are all propositional statements, and the world says you can't say those. In fact, now when you use propositional truth, if you remember, and I've tried to illustrate over the last couple of years, people are telling us that's a racist sort of statement. Friends, truth is a reality whether we acknowledge it or not, and wisdom literature is absolutely necessary. And we're learning things about nations. Just look at these verses here. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. One of the things you got to see all the way through the Old Testament, whether it's Israel or some other nation, if that nation will acknowledge the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and honor him and not follow after idols, they are a blessed group of people. It's consistent 100% of the time. The truth statement. Look at this proverb. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to what? Any people, doesn't matter if it's an ethnic Israel, America, anywhere else. How many of you know that right now there's, there's, we're, we're watching uh, lawlessness at an unprecedented state in our city? Even this week, one of, one of my friends who's a teacher here in, in, in the Twin Cities was threatened uh, 
by three girls and, and they were going to get a knife and come after this teacher. I mean, I mean, does that sound like, does that sound strange to you? Yeah, does it sound like over the top? Does that sound like something you read in Romans where it says in the last days lawlessness will increase or violence will increase? Jesus says it'll be like the days of Noah. I mean, when in history do you find, at least in our world, when would you see three teenagers, three junior high students threatening a teacher like that? I mean, it just, or and on and on we could go. So what's the answer? What's the answer? Well, sin is a disgrace to any people. I love, I love uh, Kendall and Sheila Qualls. And just recently, they called me from L.A., and they were invited to make a video asking the question, how in the world can America have a future? And I just love how Kindle responded. I'm going to show you a minute and a half of this. You have to watch the rest of it uh, at PragerU. But it's, it's a PragerU short video. But and he, he lay, outlays five things that are necessary if America is going to have a future. I want you to catch just the first one. Watch this. You don't need me to tell you what America's problems are. Plenty of people can do that. Instead, let me tell you about America's future, what it can be. I'm not making a prediction, but there's a new golden age waiting for us if we do just five things. One, reconnect with our Judeo-Christian roots. In this vision of the future, a majority of Americans realize we have to return to the basics. A new appreciation of traditional Judeo-Christian values takes place. Call it a new awakening. We became an exceptional nation because we were largely a self-governing nation, the first in human history. The U.S. Constitution begins with the phrase, we the people. But self-government only works if we are a moral country. And to be that, we need to appreciate the source of our values, the Bible. Our second president, John Adams, understood this right from the beginning. Our Constitution, he wrote, was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Of course, this doesn't mean that you have to follow a specific religion or any religion at all. That's your constitutional right. But it does mean that as a society, we recognize Judeo-Christian values as our moral compass. Point it in the right direction, a new sense of civility returns. You know what? You're not going to hear that on CNN. And that is absolutely true. What do you do with the lawlessness? What do you do with uh, kids threatening teachers and kids threatening one another? I mean, how do you find some moral compass? Christian friends, we have the answer. It's right in that book. If you want everlasting life, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to have a nation that, that will be exalted, that will, that will prosper, you have to go back and recognize the authority of of God. We're going to see that again specifically in this passage in the nation of Israel. But this isn't just true for Israel, and it's not just true for America. It would be true for any country. I've preached in all these different countries, and I can tell you right now, friends, that when, you, when people abandon the scriptures, chaos ensues, unrighteousness ensues, and no one wants to be there. Now, just think about this. Solomon dedicates the temple. We saw that in chapter 8. You remember that? dedicated the temple, and we talked about the four different temples, two preceding the cross, Solomon's temple, and then the temple of Jerubal, and then how it was remodeled, and it was destroyed in 70 AD. And then we're looking forward to a, a, a temple being built during the time of the tribulation, or right at the beginning of the tribulation, that'll be desecrated, and then the, the temple that Jesus will build in the millennial kingdom. But I just want you to remember this, there's going to be people who think, well, if there's a temple here, and there's a temple here, we need a temple now. And some Christians throughout the last 2,000 years have tried to build buildings as temples as unto the Lord. Can I just tell you, just don't, don't forget this, that if you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 6, the argument for being moral, the argument for living a life of sanctification, of not living in immorality, is the fact that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are sealed with him until the day of redemption. So if you've trusted Jesus, according to Ephesians uh, 4, until you get to heaven, until you're, until you're completely sanctified, you are sealed 
until, until that day. And so this is just massively important. What's the action point? If you're the temple of the Holy Spirit or since you're the temple of the Holy Spirit, you've been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your bodies. So turn to someone, say, you're a temple. Go ahead. And why is that important as we think about how God blesses us going forward? Because friends, you know what? This building is all temporary. This building's been a great place. We've been meeting here for, you know, uh, 30 years roughly as a church family. We met in another facility south of here for 20 years, 25 years. And you know what? This building is just a tool. It's just a tool for the temple of God, the people of God to gather and worship him. Never want to get those two confused. So temple is really important. So he dedicates the temple. And then you remember as he's dedicating the temple, he gives that exhortation in verse 61. We saw it last week. Let your heart therefore be wholly devoted to the Lord, right? Come on, guys, you got to just stick with God. Don't turn to the idols. Don't turn to immorality. God, the, the saving God who has delivered Israel, has anointed us, he's got something better. we got to be all in with Jesus, all in, in our case. And we, we emphasized that last week. Now, you say, how in were they during that dedication? I didn't point it out last week. But when they dedicated the temple, it says that they offered... $164 million worth of animals as an offering to God. Now you say, why is that important? Because here's a principle, here is a, a wisdom statement from Jesus. Jesus says, wherever your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Can you imagine a church offering one day of $164 million? Would that be like a kind of a crazy, crazy weekend? That would be a pretty crazy weekend. I mean, I've had Sundays where we had, you know, $275,000 coming in just one weekend, but, but $164 million? Yeah, and, and you say, well, is the reverse true? No, the reverse is not true. Some people would like to say, well, well, wherever your heart is, there will your treasure be also. It's the wrong order. Listen, you want to love the church more? Invest. And wherever you invest, you're going to have more love there. Relationships. I just don't, I'm just not in love with my spouse anymore. Here's the secret. Invest time, treasure, resources in your spouse, and guess what? Your affection will increase. It's just the way it works. Jesus, Jesus is giving us a truth principle there that transcends. So he's telling them, serve God with all of your heart. We know at this moment in history, they are all in. And so then God gives these if-then statements in chapter 9, and it's going to all boil down to this right here. Will they watch over their heart? Will they watch over their souls? Now, here's the sad thing. Time, temptation, blessing and temptation, their hearts are going to drift. Solomon specifically, the guy who had preached to them in 861, be wholly devoted to the Lord. Follow him all the days of our life. Let's have God's blessing. We don't want to miss out on God's blessing. The guy that said that drifts. Deuteronomy, make, write it in the margin of your Bible there, Deuteronomy 17, verse 16 says that the king shall not multiply horses, shall not multiply wives, or else they will turn his heart away, nor shall he increase his silver and gold for himself. In other words, you can't have too, many, too much money, you can't have too many horses, and you don't want a bunch of wives. All right, that's what he's, how many of you can see that in the text? All right, I'm not making this up. So God was planning ahead. Deuteronomy, you got to remember, Deuteronomy was, was written, uh, you know, 400 years before him, before they had the first king. And so it's like, okay, one of these days I'm going to give you a king. And here's the three things you kings need to know. If you mess this up, you're going to get too many horses and you're going to say, I don't need God to protect us. I've got lots of horses and I've got chariots and I'm fine. And, and these, these Canaanite women and other, other women that you're going to marry to make all these alliances and stuff with, they will push your heart away. They will push your heart away from God. Ladies have a powerful influence. Look at me, all of you. Who you marry will influence the direction and trajectory of your soul. I mean it. You are single, pay special attention. Too much silver and gold will contaminate your soul. You got there's got to be some, you got you to put on the brakes. If you've got the ability to, to, to make money, can I just be honest with you? Most of us can't handle money real well. Just, it moves our hearts. 
And so we're going to see these three things worked out in the consequences. Notice the first one there. Why guard our hearts? Well, the first reason is, is because my heart loves money too much. Your heart has a propensity to love money and to elevate it into a place it shouldn't have. Look there, 1 Kings chapter 10, starting there in verse 21. And notice what it says. All of King Solomon's drinking vessels. So it talks about, oh, back in verse, in verse, uh, in verse 14, it talks about his allotment that he gets for, of gold. Get this. In, in verse 14, it says that he gets 50,000 pounds of gold a year. That's just from Israel, not from all the merchants. And you got to read, read it in verse 15. It talks about the merchants. It talks about other governors. It talks about others who bring him gold and stuff. So if you calculate how much that is, how many, how many of you have, okay, get this. I want you to try and do this in your head without your phone. 50,000 pounds times 16, because you get 16 ounces for each pound, multiplied times 2,000. What do you got? A lot. That's the right answer. A lot. Yeah, your phone will freak out. It'll just be like 1.6 EB. I mean, it's just, it's just it's E9. I'm sorry. And it's just, it's, it's more than your phone can calculate in the space that you got. You got to turn your phone side. It's, it's a tremendous amount of money. And buying power in that day, it's incomprehensible. When it says that he was the richest man on earth, from buying power standpoint, it, you can't even calculate it. It's crazy. How much so that even the vessels that he drinks from, silver was, silver was like a stone. It had absolutely no value. So he would make all of his cups out of gold. Like at your house. You know, when I come over to your house and, and you, you know, put, the, put your best out there, it's, it's, it's always gold, solid gold, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. And, and, so, and so anyways, my point simply being is that money Compounds, 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 compounds. Wisdom brings more money. He didn't put a lid. He didn't put a ceiling on that. And as a result of that, I tell people, praise God if you've got the ability to, to make great revenue, but you got to know this, you need to set breaks on that. Say, well, I, already I tithe. That's great. That's good. You should be doing that no matter what. But there's going to be a point like, how much is enough? And he, he never sets those boundaries. And it corrupts. And you look all through history. I, I love what the Spartans said. They, they, it was one time asked why the Spartans didn't put a lot of money in the public treasury. The reason that they didn't do that is so that those made to be the guardians of it may not become corrupt. Well, these guys don't even know the Bible and they got that right. There's an interesting scholar. He, he taught history, Greek and Roman history, University of Edinburgh. Uh, he, he did not believe that a democracy was a good thing. He didn't believe the republic was a good thing. He believed a monarchy was the best form of the 26 forms of government. But he made, an inter he made several interesting observations about a democracy and a republic. And he said this, a democracy cannot exist permanently as a form of government. It can only exist until the majority discovers th that it can vote itself um, largies out of, in other words, benefits, out of the public treasury. And then if I had time, he goes on there and says, once they discover that, whoever the politician is to promise to give them the more, that's the person that they'll vote for. In other words, money will corrupt them. They don't care what happens to the nation. They don't care what happens to their children. It's about the benefits that they can get from themselves. And I get benefits by taking it from you and giving it to me. It's, a, it's fast. I mean, that was written 300 years ago. And we're seeing it worked out today. Why? Because people love money. The love of money is the root of all sorts of what? Evil. Why do people smuggle drugs across the border? Why are people trafficking young women? Why are people, people trafficking their children? Why does that happen? Because people love money more than righteousness, more than they love God. And throughout the Bible, so it's constantly giving us instruction not to be conceited or fix our hope on the uncertainty of riches, but God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Bless it, listen, financial blessing is a blessing, but it's for us to manage for the glory of God, not as an end unto itself. I so love Proverbs 30 when the prayer is offered. It says, two things I have asked of you, Lord. Don't refuse me. Keep me from those who uh, are liars and, and deceivers. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Now listen to the wisdom of this. This is a prayer of wisdom. Listen to this. Feed me with the food that is my portion that I may, not, that I may uh, be full and, 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 and not deny you. And say, 
who is the Lord? So in other words, if I get too much, then I'm going to say, who is the Lord? I'm, I, I, I don't need God. Or that, I do, um, that I'm not in want and steal. I mean, the two extremes, right? And profane God's holy name. So he, he says, God, just help me to be content with the portion, the allotment that you give me. That is really huge. That is wisdom right there. And it's true for every generation. It's true for every nation. It's true. That's a wisdom statement and a wisdom example of prayer in every generation, in every economy. There's a second thing I want you to notice, and that is you and I should watch over our hearts, guard our hearts. Why? Because it craves independence. It craves independence. Um, it talks there in, in chapter 10, starting in verse 26, about the chariots and the horsemen. Now, God warns about this simply because Israel was supposed to be a nation that was ultimately dependent upon God and not depend on mechanisms of war. In that day, if you'll think about an F-22 or you'll think about an Abrams tank or whatever the case might be, the greatest weapons of war at any given time, people tend to put their confidence in rather than God. And so Solomon gathers horses and he gathers chariots. In fact, next week I'll be up at Megiddo, uh, in Mount Megiddo, and it covers two passes coming from the sea going inland, and it covers those two passes. He ends up building that as a fortress in other cities, and he ends up, I don't know if you can see the horse. Can you see the outline of the horse there? Can you see all that? So uh, you get up on top and you see how this fortress was built out by Solomon and how he had all of these stalls there because I mean, it, was, it made good sense from a human standpoint. But the danger of it, though it made sense from a human standpoint, ultimately it would move your heart away from trusting in the living God. You know, America has a great military. We've got great men and women serving all around the country looking out for your safety and well-being today. But here's the danger. The greater the ships, the greater the aircraft, there's this, there's this propensity of our souls to act independent. Friends, it's true for you and me. When you and I have too much, and we get too much security in this world, we're ultimately going to diminish God. That's why we got to guard our hearts. You feel like your heart's running away from God and becoming independent, then God, help me to throttle that back. Help me to pull that back in. Help me to honor you as I should. There's a third thing, and that is we should guard our hearts because it perverts sex. It perverts marriage. It says, King Solomon loved many foreign women. Boy, is that an ever an understatement. And then it lists where all these, these ladies come from, including Canaanite, Canaanite nations that they weren't supposed to marry, according to Deuteronomy 7, and verse 6 and 7. Put that in the margin of your Bible. And as you read down through there, it says he's got 700 wives and, and 300 concubines. I calculated that out. That means every year he, gets, he has 17, I, I'm sure it didn't break out this way, but I try to wrap my mind around these numbers, 17.5 wives a year. So in other words... More than once a month, he has to have a wedding just, to, just for this to, to, to work out over a 40-year period of time. I'm sure it didn't work out that way. But you get my point of the magnitude of this. I mean, whoever, can, whoever had the, uh, uh, the dress shop, you know, where he was taking his, his, oh, I got another one coming here, another one coming here. She needs a dress. Let her say yes to the dress. Anyways, I, 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 don't, I don't know how that worked. But it was crazy. It was crazy. And as a result of this, God had warned that these women would drift his heart away. And as you read down through the following verses, you get down to verse 3 and 4, these women move his heart away from God. And if you love me, you'll build, you know, I worship this other, this other deity and I want you to build for me a, an altar. And he does. He builds those altars on, on the Mount of Olives, the place where Jesus is coming back to rescue Jerusalem. I'm going to be there in just like two weeks. I mean, it's it's, it's the place you look across and you see the Temple Mount, all, that picture that I'm always showing. Well, he builds altars over there. Now, what we as Americans don't get, not only is that idolatry what is sin, but then if you look at these, these women and where they're from and what those altars meant, they're sacrificing children just across from the temple that he built. And the blood of those children are crying out to God. And there's going to be some kings that are going to come down the road and they're going to just keep compounding this, compounding this, and it's going to result in the destruction of the nation. Man, this matters with God. I told you not to associate with them. I told you not to marry them. I warned you that they would lead your heart away. And it says there, and this is the historic, the Holy Spirit giving us the historical account, his wives turned his heart away from God. 
This is the guy that said, now give your heart holy to God, holy to God. And then he marries these girls. He disobeys God. As a result, now the whole nation is going to suffer the consequences of that. Just remember this, that God gives sex for four specific reasons. I've given to these to you in the past. Some of you are new. Some of you join us online haven't seen these. You need to get these. Why is it that God creates sex? Sex is a powerful thing. Um, all sorts of perversion happens around this. And just so you know, when, it's, when sex is perverted, you should know, since there's only two kingdoms, God creates it, and this is how it's supposed to be utilized. And then when Satan uses it and perverts it, it's going to look, out, it's going to look completely different. What's the purpose of, of sexuality and sex and the way that God has made us? Well, it's always in the confines, one, of marriage. And in that confines, it has four specific things that God wants to accomplish, procreation. So when somebody comes along and says, we're going to do marriage completely different or, or something like that, and we can't have procreation, it should be like a flat, I mean, there should be like this, this it should be beeping to us, right? So procreation. Um, God blessed them and said, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. And that's going to be a repeated theme. Partnership. Isn't it funny? Isn't it funny? In Genesis 2.24, it says, A man shall leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife, and the two shall become what? One flesh. That's intimacy right there. And it's interesting that people use this, this concept. They say, oh, we're not married. This is my partner. You see, in, in marriage, there's this partnership that you have with your spouse that you don't have with anybody else in this whole world. It's, I mean, you're going to have kids together. You're going to have financial investments together. You're going to, I mean, it, all of life around this partnership is massive. That's why if you're single, you better get a good partner and not a bad partner. Don't say amen to that because the implication, but you get my point. And then, and then pleasure. There is pleasure and in intimacy. Sex is a good thing. It's, but it's in the confines of marriage. Read Proverbs chapter 5, Book of Solomon, and so forth. And then also purity. Because temptation is going to come, and there's always going to be people out there trying to seduce your spouse. There's going to be people out there, if you're single, listen, if you're 12 years old, I'm just telling you, there's people out there trying to seduce you. And I just want you to know, God's got a spouse for you. You pray, you honor God, you wait, you honor Him, and you wait till God gives you that, that spouse. God has created marriage and intimacy and these four areas are massively important. Pervert those. Any perversion of that, you know, is from the kingdom of darkness. Solomon didn't get this right, and his heart drifted from God. Listen, you see, people look at Solomon and go, he had a thousand wives. You know what I would say to people sometimes? Okay, you can, you can point your finger at him. Some of you have been playing with pornography for a very long time. How many people have you been playing around with? Stop, desist, honor God. I'm telling you, it's not easy. That's why you got to guard your heart. Watch over your heart with all diligence. Lastly, I want you to notice there the outcome. What's the cost? Well, the cost is amazing because in chapter 11, after describing how he violates those three things, and again, remember, the greater the leadership, the greater the fallout, the Lord was angry with Solomon. Why? Because his heart was turned away from following the Lord. I told you. Remember, chapter 9. Chapter 9, Solomon, I told you when you dedicated the temple and you gave that great sermon, be wholeheartedly devoted to the Lord, follow him. And remember I told you, if then, if you will follow me, I'll bless you like crazy. What does it mean to follow God? What does it mean to have a whole heart towards him? What's it mean to be, be like crazy for, for God? It means we keep his commandments. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll what? Keep my commandments. And so when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we keep his commandments. Solomon, I told you if you would keep the commandments, I'd bless you. But I also told you if you don't, here's the consequences. And so here it is, buddy. Here it is. Here it is, the end of his life. The smartest guy on the planet drifts. The richest guy on the planet drifts. This guy drifts. And what's the outcome of this? So the Lord said to Solomon, because you have done this and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I commanded you. Friends, God made commandments then. God's made commandments today. The New Testament is filled with them. Follow Jesus with all of your heart. He goes on, I will surely tear the kingdom from you. Do you remember when that was said earlier? There was a guy named Saul, and he rebelled against God. And God says, I'm going to tear the kingdom from you. And you remember he says, no, no, don't take the kingdom from me. And he reaches out and grabs the prophet Samuel who delivered that. And he grabs his cloak and he, he takes a step away and it tears his, his coat. Do you remember that? And he turns to him and just as you tore my coat, 
so even so God will tear away the kingdom from you. And now we're seeing history repeated. That was 80 years ago, and now we're seeing a new king, the son of David, same scenario. And you'll notice the I will surely tear. I will not do it in your days. Notice God gives a time frame. Why does he not do it in his days? Because of David's influence. Listen, one godly influencer today may have impact on a whole nation even though he's dead. He goes, I will tear it out of uh, the hand of your son. I will not tear it um, away. uh, However, I will not tear away all of the kingdom. So now he's even given the parameters. He gives the time and now the parameters. But I will give one tribe to you. So the tribe of Benjamin will stay with you and your family, but the rest of the kingdom, the other 10 tribes, are going to be torn and given to your servants. So the bottom line is this. Solomon's going to die, and then God's going God's to exercise his judgment against Solomon and his household as a result of this disobedience because their hearts drifted. And now there's going to be a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. Can you imagine that? This was the united kingdom. David united that. He walked humbly before God. Was he perfect? No. See, I, can't, I have to qualify everything I say now, don't I? But he had a heart for God, and he was humble before God. And then he has this son, and this son grows up with a silver spoon in his mouth, and he has all of this blessing, and he's the wisest guy. He's the richest guy. He's, he lives in, in opulence. I mean, everything is like over-the-top, crazy awesome. But his heart drifts. And now he's going to end up losing the kingdom. And never again will Israel be reunited until Jesus, the the Son of God, comes together. Ultimately, that's the union we're waiting for in the days ahead. Bottom line, what do we walk away with? It's simply this. You and I need to guard our hearts with all diligence. With all diligence. Remember the story of D.L. Moody? I shared that with you last week. And how he was 17 years old wasn't interested in things of the Lord, goes to Boston to, to make $100,000. Remember that story? And he's gonna, he, his, his, his goal is to get rich. And his uncle hires him at the shoe store, but he says he's got to go to church, and he ends up having a Sunday school teacher there. You know what? You need a ministry, I'm telling you. You want an important ministry? Teach someone, teach your own children, teach someone else's children. And so, so this Sunday school teacher ends up leading D.L. Moody to Jesus. God ends up working in this life. And you remember what he says, man, God, the world has not seen one person who's been fully devoted to God, but by God's grace, I'll be that person. Well, D.L. Moody said something else, and he said this. Look at these words. No one can sum up all God is able to accomplish. Think about this. It's incomprehensible what God is able to accomplish through one solitary life, one man, one woman, Holy yielded, holy devoted, holy adjusted, holy obedient to him. And my question to you is this. Will you and I be that one person that's wholly devoted to God all the days of our life? Because if that's so, you and I could do something so amazing that God would use us in such an amazing way. The question will always come down to this ultimately. How much of your heart is for God? Friends, guard your hearts with all diligence. Watch over it day and night. It'll, it'll be prone to wander. It'll, it'll run off, and you've got to pull it back. you just got to keep pulling it back. And how do you do that? Well, part of it's washing of your mind. That's, that's why we read Scripture. That's why we pray. That's why we create rhythms with church in it. That's why we have friends around us who give godly influence, who can speak into our life and say, hey, you're stepping over the line here. You're stepping up. How many of you got a friend like that? You need a friend like that. Sometimes it's our spouse. Sometimes it's other people. For sing- I'm just telling you, you need people like that. And then as you go through the journey, you're going to find that there are different times in your life, depending on your age and depending on your, your, your finances, all these things, there's, there's going to be different phases where your heart's going to run in a special way and you're going to have to give special attention. This is a danger point. This is a choke point. This is, I, I, it wasn't like this in the past, but it is now. And I don't know what those are, but I'm going to tell you, you've got to guard your heart and God will give you success. We've got to be humble before God. God, my heart's prone to wander. God, my heart is prone to evil. God, help me guard my heart today with diligence. Would you do me a favor? Stand up, turn to someone, high five and say, hey, guard your heart. 
Guard your heart. High five them for me. You online, I want to just high five you. Guard your heart. Father, we're just thankful for this text of Scripture. Because it's easy for us to rationalize and say, well, you know, we start to give ourselves exceptions. And yet, we see Solomon with so much blessing, so much opportunity, and he couldn't hold it together. We often say, God, if, we, if I just had more opportunity, if I just had more blessing, if I just had more money, if I just had more influence, if I just had this, then I would be like, and it's not true. Christian friends, while your heads are bowed, let me ask you, how much of your heart is totally God's? I mean, are you walking zealously in his ways? Are you zealously keeping his commandments? Not to show off to others, but just because of your love and devotion to God. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Maybe you haven't trusted Christ. Trust him now. Say, Jesus, I need you. I need you to save me. I need you to wash away my sins. You died on a cross for sins. I believe that you can wash away my sins right now. The best I know how I trust you as Lord God and Savior. God, help us to draw near to you. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen.